Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for bringing to our attention not only men, but also women of faith. We pray that uh, those lessons from Sarai or Sarah's life will shine and point to Jesus Christ, the Savior, in His name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. This morning we are looking at uh, Abraham's partner in covenant. We often emphasize Abraham, but what we forget is that the one who gave birth, who actually gave birth to Isaac, was Sarah, right? I would need you to look at the worksheet. You have the two chiasms, and you will see that in the small chiasm, the one that has the focus where the name change happens, Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah, the story starts with Sarai being barren. And then she is uh, placed into antithesis with Milka, who bears children. Then Sarai is taken by the Pharaoh on this side. Sarai is taken by Abimelech on the other side. Then you have Sarah and the Annunciation of Ishmael on this side. Sarah and the Annunciation of uh, Isaac's birth on the other side. So what you can see is that Sarah is all in the story. Okay? Look at the other chiasm, the big one. It starts with Abraham marrying Sarai, and then Abraham remarrying Keturah. Right? On the other end. You have uh, foreigners and uh, Sarai on this side, and you also have foreigners and Sarai or Sarah on the other side. You have the first exodus of Hagar on this side, and you have the second exodus of Hagar on the other side, and I'm pointing out Hagar as well, because Hagar is the one that Sarah provided for Abraham as a complementary wife. So then you have uh, the birth of Isaac promised here, and the birth of Isaac happening, actually happening here on the other side. So what I just wanted to point out is that Sarah is very present in the story. And the most obvious point that shows that Sarah is important in the story is right here. When the name change happens, it's not only Abram being changed into Abraham, it is also Sarai being changed into Sarah. Interestingly, in both names, the letter H is added. And many have come to the conclusion that the two H's are from the name Yahweh. I transliterated it. See? Telling them somehow that, hey, you both belong to me. So, the covenant is not merely Abraham's covenant with God. Sarah is somehow part of the covenant. How? Well, Sarah obviously is Abraham's wife and therefore partner in the covenant. All right, now go to the other side of your worksheet. And we are going to go chronologically through some very interesting events. First reality we get to know about Sarah, 
right at the beginning in chapter 11 is that Sarah is barren. So we are being told from the very beginning Sarah is barren. So then the natural question is, hey, if she is barren, then why bother calling Abraham and promising him he will be a great nation? You understand the challenge? Then we find in chapter 12 that Sarai is also beautiful. Not just beautiful, like beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Oh. So much beautiful that she gets Abraham in trouble. Well, is it her mistake now? Is it her problem? Is it somebody's problem if she is beautiful? Or it's his insecurities? Because if you read the whole story, when he speaks to Abimelech, who's the second king, the second king that gets Abraham in trouble, he tells Abimelech that this has now become customary for them, that Wherever they go, he would ask Sarai, then Sarah, to say, hey, let's just say this, okay? We are brother and sister, we are siblings, and that's it. So, she's a beautiful woman. Obviously, trouble comes out of that, and sometimes same happens today. Some men are insecure, and... Uh, <laughs> that would create problem, and they may blame the beauty of the wife. But then Sarai again pops up in chapter 16, very significantly, when she comes with the human solution to provide Abraham with a complementary wife. And chapter 16 is a chiasm of its own, like a structure that looks like a rooftop. And the highest point of the chiasm is verses 7 and 8 in chapter 16. And there you can read, Now the angel of the Lord found her, which is Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring of on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? What you can see from that description is that God takes care of Hagar. Sarai messes things up and she treats Hagar badly. Hagar leaves runs away, flees, the angel of the Lord comes and comforts Hagar and tells her, go back, go back. She probably had her component of uh, the story going wrong as well. But obviously God is in control. Then Sarai becomes Sarah. Here is the name change. What I would like to see is that the story in chapter 17 is told in a way in which it's very visible, very obvious that what happens to Abraham also happens to Sarah. Look at chapter 17 and see the parallel between Abraham and Sarai. Abram becoming Abraham and Sarai becoming Sarah. I put in your worksheet verses 3 to 5, 3 to 6 actually, on one side, and then 15 to 16, 17 on the other side. The structure starts and ends with this. Abram fell on his face. Abraham fell on his face. Can you see the structure there? Verses 3 and verse 
17. 3 and 17. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. God speaking to Abram. He would be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. Please keep those promises in mind, and now jump to Sarai. Then God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Father of nations? Mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Kings shall come from you, God told Abraham before. And then Abraham fell on his face and left. Okay? Obviously, you have Abraham becoming Abraham, Sarai becoming Sarah, but the blessing is for both. The promise is for both because you cannot do this procreation business alone at least not in that context. Sarah, then, is reconfirmed as Abraham's partner in covenant, in God's covenant, in chapter 18. In chapter 18, you know that story when the three messengers come to their tent, and there you find out that Sarah was a good housewife as well just pointing that out so nobody will get the impression that beauty and cooking cannot go together. No, she knows how to cook because when those messengers come and Abraham realizes, hey, they should eat something, he goes straight to her, right? So in that chiasm in chapter 18, you have verse 12 as a center. This is what it says. Therefore Sarah left within herself, saying, After I have grown old, some translations say, After I became withered, or after I became worn out, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? So that chiastic structure emphasizes impossibility. But we know about this impossibility from the very beginning. Sarah is, before anything else, what? Barren. So we have an impossibility. Now, if there is an impossibility for somebody to bear or give birth to children, conceive before everything else, in her youth, how does that impossibility become with aging? It's an impossible impossibility, right? So in chapter 18, God reconfirms. He says, in a year from now, I'll be back. Telling her, square, you will be conceiving. Now, I just have to mention here that conception here is a miracle, but it does not eliminate the human component of it. Just emphasizing that aging does not necessarily eliminate romantic love between husband and wife. Yes, they were doubting seriously that they could ever conceive and have a child, but they are still on it. 
Let's move on and look in chapter 20. After all this is happening, and uh, what is the age of Sarah at this time? 90. And Abraham is 100. Well, a little short of 90 and a little short of 100. In chapter 20, you have a very weird story if you look at it chronologically. Because this is the time when Sarah is taken away again by a foreign king. I have a question for men. Do you know when a woman is the most beautiful? When she's pregnant. Now, if you have never been pregnant, I'm not saying in any way that you are not beautiful. What I'm saying, though, is there's a special kind of shininess to a woman when she gets pregnant. A glow in. Okay. What is interesting is you have a 90-year-old woman that gets the attention of a king. She's so glowing, she's so beautiful still, that the king wants her. Now, here the debate can happen whether the reason why Abimelech wanted Sarah at his palace was really her beauty or not, because in the text... This time, when she is 90, her beauty is not emphasized. What we know, that she was taken to the palace. The king did not have intercourse with her. We know it from the text. We don't know that for sure in the previous incident with Pharaoh. Something must have attracted Abimelech. Or at least he wanted some sort of alliance with Abraham. Because Abraham was a wealthy guy. And it was customary in those days for somebody to try to get into a blood relationship alliance with somebody else based on some economic interests. And that becomes even more obvious later on when Abimelech comes back to Abraham and says, hey, let's do a kindness covenant between the two of us. Let's make sure we are not going to disturb one another living in the same territory. All right, Sarah miraculously conceives. Not miraculously in the sense that uh, Abraham is not involved. In the sense that she's barren, she's old, Abraham isn't younger than her, but she conceives, she gives birth, and watch this, she nurses a baby. Now, at 90, for a lady to nurse a baby, that's laughable. That's laughable, right? No wonder the name of Isaac is laugh. But it is a miracle, for sure. So God is working miracles at every step. Then Sarah wakes up. And she says, okay, but now we have Ishmael and Isaac. I want Ishmael out. I want to protect Isaac. And... Um, even God concedes. And Hagar and Ishmael have to leave. Then the final moment when we know about Sarah is when she dies. Interestingly, there's a whole chapter, chapter 23, focusing on Sarah's death and burial. And because Abraham really wants to give the right respect to his deceased wife's memory, he buys a burial place. This is what it says in 23 verse 2. So Sarah died and Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Those are very strong words. 
mourn for Sarah and weep for her. Abraham was a believer. He was walking with the Lord. But he wasn't walking alone. And there's something very human here happening. Abraham took his time to mourn and to weep. You may ask, why not just weep? Why mourn also? I don't know if you know what mourning meant historically. When somebody would stop at the body of somebody that was dear to his or her heart and would start mourning when they cry and say things. So there is a very human element involved in the story and God doesn't skip it. And then Abraham goes to find a burial place and there's a little chiasm there where Hebron is emphasized because in the same burial place you will find Isaac and Rebekah later and Jacob and Leah as well. All these families are buried in Hebron. So what do we get from here? Abraham cannot be seen alone. You have to see Sarah alongside. Abraham is a man of faith. And his faith relationship with God is emphasized strongly in Hebrews chapter 11. But guess what? In Hebrews chapter 11, it's not only Abraham's faith that is emphasized, but also Sarah's faith. So in spite of all the human weaknesses of both, there were times when Abraham failed. There were times when Sarah obviously failed. God was still working with them. And at the end of the day, at the end of the journey, about both of them, God says, yes, by faith. Actually, if we are faithful to the biblical definition of faith, where faith is not just a theoretical adherence or acceptance of some ideas, faith is relationship, faith is trust and faithfulness, because faithfulness comes from faith's fullness, even in the English language. If you take faith as faithfulness, then about both of them, we are told by faithfulness, Abraham, and by faithfulness, Sarah. When they messed up, God did not kick them out of the covenant, but God tried to do the best for them to rehabilitate them and bring them back to the calling that he already gave them. And whenever something happens, something wrong happens, God reconfirms, hey, I'm, I'm still here. I'm still working with you. Why have you been laughing? I have been not laughing. Yes, you have been laughing. Me? Yeah. And next year I'll be back. And indeed, next year, God is back. But before next year, they have another incident where Abimelech takes her away. Because they have not learned the lesson. Huh? And God still works with them? Yes, because faithfulness does not depend, is not based in my faithfulness. It's based in His faithfulness, God's faithfulness. Questions? Why did God call Sarah out and not Abraham when she was laughing? Because there is an instance before when he was laughing. I think it's in chapter 17. You have the verse? 17, 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, 
Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? So Abraham left too. And Abraham said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. We spoke about this last time. Then God said, So here, the context is, God is having a conversation with Abraham. And the conversation goes on. In the other situation, God is speaking with Abraham and Sarah is laughing on the side. And God kind of turns to her and says, hey, why have you been laughing? No, I haven't. So that's the difference in the context. I would suppose if God was, had been conversing with somebody else and Abraham had been laughing on the side, he would have called him out as well. Yeah. So the point is that uh, he fell on his face. So the question is, was, it, was that an expression of reverence toward God? Or was it just a natural manifestation? He couldn't hold it, so he just <laughs> fell down and, and laughed. I think it's a combination of both. When God enters into a relationship with a human being, God does not suppress human feelings and human reactions. You can feel at ease expressing what you feel, right? If you think it's laughable, you can laugh or cry if uh, something makes you cry. God doesn't have a problem with that. And the problem in Sarah's situation is not that God had a problem with her laughing, because it was laughable. But the story points out that she would even deny she laughed. Okay, so there's a different nuance to it. Thank you for that observation. Yes. So the question is, what was circumcision? How did it happen? Was there a certain ritual involved? Was it performed by somebody specific in a specific way? We have the description in chapter 17 and verse 19 says, Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife shall bear you a son and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. So the covenant, the everlasting covenant is established with Isaac. But if you go back to verse 13, it says, He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male male child, who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. And then at the end of the chapter, verse 23 says, So Abraham took Ishmael, his son, and all who were born in his house, and all who were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin that very same day as God had said to him. If I'm understanding this right, the surgery was done by Abraham himself because he took them. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. So the question is, who circumcised Abraham? Did he perform surgery on his own body? And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised and his son Ishmael. 
and all the men of his house born in the house of uh, or bought with money from a foreigner were circumcised with him. It sounds very repetitive for a very simple reason. It's a chiasm, and you have the same wording on both sides, and the focus is that Abraham and Ishmael, being placed in parallel constructions, were both circumcised on the same day. We don't have the process itself. I mean, if he had such a huge household, did he go and perform surgery on all the males? Because it's on the same day. Or can we assume that in his household there were medical people as well? well in that context, people that knew something about it? Hard to say. Based on the text, the emphasis is not on the procedure itself. The emphasis is on the fact that both Abraham and Ishmael were circumcised on the same day. And I emphasize this to show that Ishmael was not eliminated from the covenant. Ishmael was included in the covenant. Because in a certain way, the covenant was with Abraham and his entire household. Isaac was the one that carried the covenant on. But all those included in the covenant and circumcised, they were part of the Abrahamic blessing and promise as well. Good question. So would Ishmael in that sense represent the Gentiles? I would say no, because Ishmael is not a Gentile in this context. Ishmael is included in the covenant. The Gentiles are not. So I would rather see Ishmael on the side of the believers in this context. And I'm not speaking about his offsprings and then, because you can have the same dilemma with the Jews coming from uh, Isaac and Jacob as well later on, because they also rebelled against God. But at this point, I have to see Ishmael in the covenant, not outside of the covenant. And as I pointed out before, the mere fact that God called Abraham to be in a covenant with him for a certain reason, for preparing the corridor for the coming of the Messiah, does not mean that God was not working with the other nations. We have a certain moment in chapter 20 when Abimelech, very upset with Abraham, asks him, how could you do something like this to me? And Abraham says, because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place. And lo and behold, the fear of God was in that place. Because God was speaking to Abimelech, the pagan. So in the context of the covenant, being in the covenant is not a sort of divine favoritism to the expense or to the exclusion of everybody else from divine favor. No, it is a certain purpose a certain plan that God carries out in history through a family, through a nation, through a certain lineage. But other than that, God does work in His ways, in different ways, in every nation. The Holy Spirit is not limited to a corridor. Good question. So, in the book of Acts, you can look at chapter 15, one of the major contentions in the early Christian church was should the Gentiles that accept Jesus Christ as their Savior be circumcised? And the conclusion of the first council in Jerusalem, Acts 
chapter 15 is no, they should not. So it seems that this sign of the covenant, of the circumcision in the flesh, in the body, only applies up to Jesus' coming, first coming and the cross, when the corridor, so to speak, is enlarged and invites every nation in. So from that point on, we don't see circumcision as a mandatory sign of God's covenant. It seems that somehow baptism takes the place of that sign. But the application that the Apostle Paul makes is different, though. He says, instead of the covenant being ratified by circumcision in the flesh, it is ratified now by a circumcision of the heart, which to me seems to be different than um, using baptism as an equivalent of uh, circumcision. Now, a dilemma remains for those that uh, come from a, a Jewish ethnic background today. Should they still go on circumcising? There is a very tricky moment when Paul asks Timothy, who was a Jew, to get circumcised, so his uncircumcision will not get in the way of the gospel, will not become a hindrance to the gospel. Was that really needed? Or was just a removal of a stumbling block? I would say it's a removal of a stumbling block. But then you know that there are people today that are circumcised. So is it mandatory? No, it's not. Biblically, it's not. Can it be done? I don't think we have biblical arguments against it. Yeah. Aren't there medical benefits of being circumcised? To that question, my answer is, I don't know. Because then you can well ask the question, okay, if there is health benefits attached to circumcision, why did God create foreskins? And if there is health benefit in it, then why didn't God say, okay, so now all Gentiles that come to the Lord, uh, let them uh, benefit of that health benefit. Okay, so it can be tricky if you go there. There might be health benefits. But again, who knows? Really. So if I'm getting the question right is... Why would God use such a dramatic tool, such a psychologically impactful tool? Maybe that's exactly why. Maybe he wanted something dramatic and something psychologically impactful at that time, historically, to really make a difference and make a statement historically that something is starting here, something leading to something great. Now, looking at the act of circumcision from a medical perspective, don't think circumcision done at the time that the Bible indicates is uh, such a disturbing and uh, traumatic and dramatic experience. From what I can understand, it's not. Because uh, vascularization at that early stage of life is not very strong in that area, so it's not a very painful and uh, traumatic experience. That's a very good question. And obviously, never, nowhere in the Bible you can see any kind of mutilation, if I may use that word, in the case of women. So somehow, in a patriarchal society, 
it seems that that's what God's option was. One of my questions would be, based on chapter 18, when God speaks about this, the name change of Sarah, why doesn't God go to Sarah and tell her, Sarai, you're not Sarai any longer, you are Sarah from this day on. Why does God discuss all that with Abraham? I believe the Bible and the teaching of the Bible is revealed in a certain social context. In a society where there's a certain societal structure as well. Obviously, the natural context, the social context of God's revelation starts at least in a very strong patriarchal society. Is that an argument? Why God only applies the rule, the sign of the covenant to males and not females as well? Obviously, in the covenant relationship, God discusses these terms of the covenant with the man. Does that tie into the relationship established by God at the fall? Because in my view, before the fall, there is no subordination. It's total equalitarian relationship between husband and wife. It can be discussed, however, whether after the fall, the same kind of relationship is maintained. It looks like, based on uh, Genesis chapter 3, that the male is, giving, is being given the husband, because this is just a husband-wife relationship, from what I can understand there, is given some sort of a messianic role when he becomes a marshal, a provider for his wife. And it seems that in the Abraham-Sarah relationship, that quality of Abraham being the provider for his wife and the family is very strong. So it may be that that also plays a role in this God-established covenantal sign, that it goes with the manly side of the family. I don't know if I said anything new to you. So the question was, what happened between Abraham and Hagar? Was that adultery? Was that sinful in any ways. What we have to emphasize is that when Sarah comes with the idea, with the human solution, look at chapter 16. Yes, okay, verse 3. Then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. I know uh, you have heard sermons in which Hagar was a concubine or some sort of, uh, I don't know, extramarital relationship. The text says when Sarai gave her to her husband, she gave her as a wife. So we obviously are speaking about polygamy here. Polygamy. And if you want to be very biblical, you have to admit that many of God's faithful people were polygamous. And polygamy created so much trouble in those families. And to this day, there are families in some places, even Seventh-day Adventists, that are polygamous. Because that's the societal norm in those places. Is that God's ideal? No. In the creation account, you have Adam and Eve and no other components. And then in the New Testament, established by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, for instance, that each husband should have his wife, each wife should have her husband, singular, 
But obviously, polygamy was a big part of those societies in those days. And God started working with people where they were. At this time in Christianity, polygamy is not a, a big thing. It's not a rule. It's rather an exception. When the gospel finds somebody in that state, the gospel starts working from that state, that frame of mind. Under no circumstance can I encourage anybody to become an Abraham in that sense to accept from Sarai a complimentary wife. <laughs> Lord, may your spirit continue to deepen our understanding in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.